Hello everybody, um, I think we should be live now. Uh, apologies to those of you who might have been uh, waiting um, because I think we had a bit of a technical issue. Us people who work in TV, you know, computers and stuff like that, we don't really understand them. So sorry about that. Uh, some questions coming out already. Uh, Tim Kim is number one. He says, what's up, Jeremy? Well, like, uh, I'm, now, I'm now live answering your, your questions, anybody who's there. We've also got, I'll tell you what I'll do, before, just um, while we're waiting for actual questions to come in, there's some that have come in um, early. Uh, this one is Amy Nance. And she says, how long does it take to film each episode? And the answer is, is generally speaking, three weeks. Uh, we're based in the UK, so three weeks between leaving and coming back here. And uh, of that time, sometimes not all that long uh, spent fishing, sometimes just three or four days. Uh, if it's something that we know is going to take um, a, a lot of work, maybe uh, you know, it might be as much as 10 or 11 days sometimes. But basically, if we haven't got a result, we haven't got a program. So there are times when it can get a little bit desperate. Okay, um, Alice Acidland, please come to Southeast Asia for the monster fish trip again. Um, I'm looking for questions here. What's the strangest fish you've ever caught? Strangest? I mean, they're all pretty strange, aren't they? I think lampreys take a bit of be beating. Those of you who saw that program, um, they don't have a proper backbone, they don't have jaws, they just got this sucker, I had that one stuck on my neck, that was a weird feeling. Um, I wouldn't want to do that again in a hurry. Um, do you ever take fishing trips? This is Drew Baluski, it looked like, sorry, the name disappeared off the top before I read it properly. Uh, fishing for pleasure. Do you know I don't these days, hardly ever. Um, I, I don't have a lot of time. I, it is pretty full time making river monsters and when I'm not actually away, which is like half of the year, uh, my time is taken up doing the um, things like voiceovers, studio shoots, meetings, all that kind of thing. I'll just take one more of these. Um, Bradley Staggs, he says, what is your favourite fish that you appreciate and admire above all others? That's interesting that, you know, do you admire fish? Actually, yes, I do. I mean, um, I think if pushed, I'd say arapaima. I mean, arapaima, I, I, you know, I've got a lot of history with arapaima. Um, one of them, some of you might know, actually whacked me in the chest. Very, very painful. I still felt that um, six weeks afterwards. That's how hard they can hit you. That wasn't a particularly big arapaima either. But um, why do I admire them because of that? They're, they're actually, well, they're surprisingly intelligent fish. Um, fish generally you don't think of as intelligent. But I spent a lot of time with fishermen in the Amazon um, hunting arapaima. And... Uh, the, the arapaima are just um, really good at giving fishermen the slip. You, you, you imagine if someone's got a net, nothing's going to get away. But arapaima are very good at jumping over nets, uh, getting underneath nets. Uh, they will even, and I've seen this, they will even make a hole in a the net. They, they will, instead of panicking when they feel a net, um, if they're in a place where they've been fished, they will put their nose in one of the holes of the net and then they just expand their head and they'll break, they'll break that net and just slip through, causing hardly any disturbance at all. And that's, that's fairly admirable, I'd say. Um, let's see what else we've got. Uh, somebody there. Philip Kelly, have I ever caught black marlin? Uh, yes, I have. Not, not huge black marlin, but um, as, as a lot of you know, um, season 8 River Monsters, I'm going more into the sea, which is not you know, something I've dabbled in before, but we've got a whole season uh, this year in the sea. It's, quite, it's different, it's, you know, there's certain transferable skills from fishing freshwater to fishing saltwater. Um, I tend to get very intimidated by large bodies of water, and that, and that goes for big rivers and big lakes uh, as well. They're sort of harder to read, but if you work at it, you, you can track the fish down and the same goes for the sea as well. Um, let's, how long, here we go, Chantal Edwards, how long are you in one location while, while filming? That's similar to the earlier question, uh, th it's three weeks for a shoot. Um, the shoots that I really like are the ones where you stay in one location and you can unpack all your stuff and it's not just my fishing gear but I mean the amount of technical gear that we have with us um, we have generators we have computers we you know there's people backing up what we shoot um, and if you just have one base that's great you can get really organized but a lot of our shoots we're moving every day or every two days sometimes uh, if you can imagine you're in a rainforest where you're knee deep in mud and my job is hard enough but the people who have to keep the batteries charged and 
uh, protect what we're filming, uh, you know, they have a really hard job. In the old days, on tape, this is until about, I don't know, three or four years ago, you just put all your tapes in a box and, and I hope they don't get wet and look after them. Uh, nowadays, everything goes onto, onto drives and cards and stuff I don't understand. And, uh, you know, it's duplicated, it's backed up, but you, you know, you've got electricity and water in very close proximity, so um, that's challenging. Uh, let's have a look now. Um, if you make it, uh, Brandon Mason, I'd like to throw a line with you. If you make it to Missouri, uh, I was in, yes, we fished. I fished uh, Lake of the Ozarks, wasn't it, a few years ago, um, fishing for blue catfish. Had a very nice, uh, lots of small blues and one lucky catch of a, of a very big one there. Um, Corey Williams, have you ever thought about bringing a fan with you a day fishing trip? It's generally, um, yes, we keep getting this request, but we, we generally, um, when I fish, I'm, I'm, I'm normally, I prefer to fish solo. Um, I fish with a very small crew, and the thing is, fish are wild animals, and you want to keep the number of people, the, the amount of gear down to a minimum. So we even, we even have reporters wanting to come and fish with us, and generally, you know, we just have to say no, it's, it's just not possible. Um, okay. Um, somebody else, Jerry Bainath says, what's up, man? I'll tell you what's up recently. Um, the, the Deaf Down Under episode has just aired in the US, and the, uh, something that we didn't expect from that, part of that story, those of you who've seen it, incidentally, if you haven't seen that program, there's another chance to see it tonight before the, the premiere of the new episode, Razorhead. So, um, Deaf Down Under in Australia. Um, in the middle of filming that, we we rescued a castaway and we thought, well, this is, well, that's you know, what we were making a program about was um, how that environment is so, so hostile, so potentially dangerous. And we're talking the northern end of Australia in the hottest time of the year. And um, so we're making this program all about that, that, that environment and the dangers of it. And we, we stumbled into this guy. Um, and the island, apart from us and him, um, completely uninhabited. He'd been there a couple of days. Um, he'd, he'd left his boat on the other side of the island. He'd walked across by a path. Um, he couldn't find the path back. He'd got lost. Uh, he was starting to get confused in all that, in, in the heat. Uh, he didn't have water. He spent, um, he spent one night out. The next night he spent out, he was, um, he was expecting the sun to come up in a particular position. It came up somewhere completely different. So, you know, he was in a fairly desperate situation. So I know an amazing bit of good luck that we turned up. And uh, since that program showed, uh, there's been a lot of interest from various media outlets. So I've been talking to reporters about that. Um, so that's, uh, although we filmed that a little while ago, it's, it, it's quite nice to remember that and remember our sort of um, our, our good deed that we did uh, there, but I mean, just luck. I mean, just a, you know, if we hadn't shown up, it could have been very bad. Okay, um, Laura Virginia says, Saludos desde RD. Where is RD? I don't know, I should know. Is that a US state? No, it's not. I can't, I can't think. I've got to move on, but thank you very much. Um, Mark Zamora says, where can I get the picture frame of fish behind you? The, what you can see in the background, um, I'm at the production office at the moment in Bristol in the UK, southwest uh, England, and um, actually a very important point, all the fish that I catch, it, it's all about catch and release. Those fish go back alive into the water and we spend as little time as possible with them out of the water. It's like a, Formula One uh, pit stop or you know, NASCAR racing. Basically, the fish comes out, we film it, and it goes back. One shot at it. You know, I don't have. If I get my words wrong, whatever, that's just too bad. Um, so we we get that that fish on film. But in terms of a trophy, what we do there's a there's an artist here, um, and we commission him, and he does these lovely watercolor pictures. And so this room. Um, that's just a fraction that you can see behind me. The room, its, it's walls are covered in, in weird and wonderful fish. There's still a few spaces left, um, so uh, there will be some more joining them in the future. But it's quite a, an impressive shoal. Uh, Ryan Ball, how can I meet you in the US? Unfortunately, I, I was in the US um, 
a couple of weeks ago, um, I was I was launching the, the the new season. I am now. That's probably it for quite a long time. I'm I'm now more worldwide globe trotting. I'm off this weekend. I can't say where because you know I'm I have a uh, you know I have people who uh, will probably do me bodily harm if I um, sort of give the game away too much in advance of what's on TV. So US, don't know when I'm coming back there. I'm afraid. And normally I'm whisked around very quickly talking to, to magazines and things like that. Uh, Jean, Jean de Saint Jean, what is your favorite food? Um, a lot of people assume that I must eat lots of fish. Um, I do eat fish, I do like fish, I tend to be responsible, I try to be responsible about, about the fish that I eat. Um, I try to eat fish that have um, come from a, a source where there's plenty, there's plenty of them. Um, and you know, unfortunately, although we live in the information age, here we are, I'm talking to I don't know how many people, I mean, you know, amazing communication that we've got these days, but if you try and find out where your fish came from, uh, very often nobody can tell you, and why can't they tell you? It's probably because they don't want to tell you, it probably, you know, it might even be illegal, or you know, who knows, so, um, I, you know, I tend, that's one of my sort of, um, one of my bugbears, the whole, the whole thing about fish, but, you know, if you can eat, if you can find, um, well, I mean, sometimes I eat the fish that I catch. I don't very often, of course. You know, something that weighs 200 pounds, I might have a fairly big stomach, but I couldn't eat something that size. So small fish, uh, if there's lots of them, um, I will sometimes eat, particularly if we're living off the land. And as anybody knows, fresh fish are way bigger, than, way bigger, way better than something that's, uh, you know, that's been frozen or whatever. Um, where are we? Melissa Grandi, scariest moment while filming. Um, some of you will know this. I've, I've. Uh, this was pre River Monsters, but I did a, a sort of a, a, a lower profile series before that, and I was in the Amazon. I was in a light plane, doing some aerial filming, and the engine, um, the engine stopped working, and we we crashed into the forest. So that was that was pretty scary, but it was over pretty quickly, actually, amazingly quickly, and nobody was hurt, which was even more amazing. Um, I'm going to take. A, I'm going to do a couple more of these, and this is Alex Alexi Sinot who asks a very personal question, um, how old are you? And uh, right, I mean, I'm slightly hesitant to answer this, but I'll say it very quickly and then it will disappear into the ether. No, it won't, it'll be on here forever, won't it? Um, I'm actually, I, I turned 60 um, very recently and I had a surprise party, which was great. Uh, my brother, I, I, I've got a brother who I've traveled with a couple of times and uh, he invited me for a meal around his house and then he sent me a text. He said, look, I don't want my wife to, um, you know, sort of go to the shop and make a meal. Let's go out to the, to a pub and just have a have a meal there. So we we got in the car. We go to this place. He heads off looking for a table, and I followed him. And I went into this room that was just full of people. And I'm thinking, well, there's no way that we're going to get a table in here. Then I start looking around, and I realise that I knew everybody in that room. And I, I'm actually quite a simple kind of person. If somebody if somebody tells me something, I tend to believe them, and so um, what I was seeing didn't fit with what I'd been told. So of course it was a it, it was a surprise birthday party, but um, it, it took there was about thirty seconds of me sort of standing open mouthed, and, you know, while that fact um, sunk in. It was great. Lots of people I worked with, and, and um, people uh, friends of mine from years back who have supported me over the years. Because before I was making River Monsters, I, I spent twenty odd years traveling uh, on a very low budget all over the world, um, occasionally writing articles about it, but not getting a lot of interest, to be honest. And a lot of people thought I was completely wasting my time. And why don't you get a proper job? And uh, I sort of resisted uh, the voice of good sense, if you like, and, and here we are, we're now producing this program that so many people enjoy. So I'm, I'm glad I had their support and I'm glad Everybody tuning in is, is appreciative of, of what we do. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Scotty D. Finlayson, learn any new languages? Um, I'm trying to learn Spanish at the moment. Um, I, the, the only language I speak sort of reasonably well is Portuguese, which I learned in order to go to Brazil. Um, Portuguese helps me to understand Spanish. Um, particularly when it's written, I can look at written, written Spanish and understand it pretty well. Um, when I try to speak Spanish, though, it comes out as Portuguese, or it now comes out as a mixture. So I'm, I, it's actually made a mess of my Portuguese. Um, I think I should try something which is very, very different from Portuguese. You know, then, then you're not going to get that sort of dreadful sort of 
cross-contamination going on. Um, Jamie Mug sorry, I'm Mugatio. What effect do you think the earthquake in Ecuador has had on ocean life? Um, apologies for not getting your name very good there. It's a very small screen that I have to squint at. Um, I'm not. Sh I don't know. I mean, you know, the the. I'm I'm not thinking it's going to have had a huge effect. I mean, the, the, there's there's. The, the sea is not only a huge area, it's a huge depth as well. There's an enormous volume of water. We, we, when we think of the world, we are thinking of uh, the land. And, you know, most of the world is this lightless zone where creatures live that haven't changed for millions of years. You know, creatures you know, live in the sea that were there before the dinosaurs. Um, were probably unaware of dinosaurs. Um, maybe the odd pterodactyl cr crashed into the sea, crash landed, and they went on and fed on it. But you know, life in the sea or in the depths of the sea tends to be pretty resilient to that kind of event. Uh, what what it's not so resistant to is particularly things like pollution. That's you know that that is more of a problem than the odd seismic event which has been you know happening over the millennia. Um, Someone here says, how, how is my thumb um, since catching the grouper? Well, um, you, can, you should be able to see that my thumb has recovered. It actually um, did eventually. Um, those of you who saw that episode, those who, who, who didn't see that episode, it's on again tonight. Um, I was um, using my, well, I actually had, I had sticking plaster around my thumb to give it a bit of protection. And what happened was that I, I hooked into this big fish and the, the reel is rotating so fast it actually ripped off the plaster and it's then melting my, my thumb. I have had people email me and, and, and sort of tell me, don't you know you've got a drag on your reel and, uh, or you need a better reel and all this kind of stuff. I'm, sort of, I'm aware of that. Um, I do like to use my thumb though for fine control. I find that I can I can I can I can get fine control with my thumb that I can't get with a with a drag. And um, what was frustrating about that uh, that catch was that I did eventually manage to stop that fish. I mean, it was very very painful. People in the crew were saying, "Why?" You know, they were looking at my thumb and, and almost sort of you know they were wincing. And uh, why did you? Why didn't you just? take your thumb off and I guess that's the difference between someone who fishes and someone who doesn't. Um, we needed to catch that fish. I won't say too much about that because um, I'm aware that some of you haven't seen that uh, that episode. Um, there is, uh, um, I, sometimes I get annoyed on, on camera and uh, after this whole incident that we're talking about now there is the, the all-time um, the all-time biggest outburst from me ever recorded on River Monsters. It, it sort of leaves any other... I think the, the previous time was when I got stabbed by a catfish in the back of my hand in Argentina a few years ago. I, I, I let rip a bit verbally after that, but on this occasion, I, you know, it's... Uh, it, <laughs> you'll, you'll have to see it. You know what I'm talking about if you've seen it. Anyway, we've got a few more questions here. Um, Andy Chang, what's the most proud fish you've fished? I think, um, let me see, I, I think what fish am I most proud of? Possibly, um, if in doubt, my answer to a lot of questions is Goliath tigerfish, Congo. Um, this, this is, a, um, it's an incredible looking fish. It's, it's difficult to catch anyway, but what makes it particularly difficult to catch is it's just so hard to get into that part of the world. Nobody normally goes to that part of, of Central Africa. Uh, it's certainly not a tourist destination. And, and there were just so many different difficulties there and I think that the memorable fish, people who fish will understand this, um, the memorable fish are the ones that were hardest to catch, the, one, the ones where you really didn't think that you were going to and um, and yeah the Goliath tiger fish ticks, ticks all the right boxes there. Um, got one here from Amy Powell, uh, when did you realize you had a love of fishing? Well I think um, I started fishing when I was about seven or eight and I caught my first fish at about that age and it was literally just, just a few inches long. And um, I don't know at that time if it, you could describe it as a love of fishing. I, um, it certainly got my curiosity going and I, I, I wanted to see what other fish were there, I wanted to see bigger fish, I wanted to 
um, go further along the river, around the next bend, see what was there. And, and I think, yeah, gradually what developed was a love of fishing. I, I, I liked... Um, I like just being out in the countryside on my own. Um, there is something very uh, restorative, which I, I recognised even at that young age, something about just sitting still in the landscape. It's a great antidote to the pressures of life. And, and actually one thing these days that um, I, I think kids these days are, are under more pressure, if that's possible, than I was when I was a kid. I mean, the amount of here in the UK, I mean, you're at school, you're tested to within an inch of your life all the time. And what's the what's the point of that? And you know, it's it's you know, you need something to uh, you know provide an antidote to that. Um, another one here. Oh, this is another personal one. This is Kate Superland from Texas. Here we go. Case. I was curious and don't want to embarrass you. Well, it's too late for that because you have already. Uh, do you have a wife stroke girlfriend partner? Uh, wife, no. Girlfriend, sometimes. Partner, well, it's sort of the same thing, isn't it? But um, there you go. Mystery, uh, some mystery solved on that one, partially. Thomas Schmidt, Jeremy, do you think it's a good idea that the European Wells catfish is released in South America for fishing purposes? I never even knew about that. Um, I would say no, generally speaking, that's a very serious point here, generally speaking, do not take one species and put it somewhere else. It's been done on quite a few occasions, and even when it's done with sort of the best scientific advice, there's normally some unexpected consequence. Uh, we made a program a couple of years ago about uh, this, the South American pacu that had been introduced into Papua New Guinea with um, interesting consequences. Excuse me a minute. When I talk a lot, particularly when I'm trying to talk get a lot in, my mouth gets a bit dry. Um, Wells catfish have been introduced in, uh, in places where they, where they weren't native, and it, from an angler's point of view, it's, it's sort of great. Um, here's a big fish that you can catch, but you, you never know what else it might do. Um, again, the episode that we made, um, there were those poor people in Germany who were swimming in a lake, uh, they had no idea Wells catfish were in there and something bites them on the leg. Uh, that's that's going to be pretty upsetting if you're not experiencing if you're not expecting it. So yeah, it, it, moving fish around much better is to look after the fish that are there in the first place that are already there, and there's there's not enough of that going on. Um, reintroduce some of the big fish. You know, South America is full of big fish species, but but they are they're dying out. And arapaima, you've got to really look hard to find arapaima. Um, you have you have huge catfish there anyway. You you have you have Jao, you have Piraiba, and these things are are disappearing. You know, don't put another species in there. Look after the ones that are there. You know, do a bit of management um, of of the fishing. It's very challenging, but um, other rivers have been turned around. You know, other fish populations in, in the U.S. I mean, the Hudson's a great example. Um, uh, the, you know, the Hudson has been brought back from near death. There are sturgeon now in the, again in the Hudson. In the, Hudson. Um, the Columbia River, an, another good example of a river that um, uh, where you know things were not looking good, and, and, and good management has has brought it brought it back to life. Um, Deborah Gazelli Hewson says, during the film of any seasons, have you ever thought of giving up? Was there a time when things got too dangerous or risky? Um, sort of giving up isn't an option. If we don't get the, the, the fish that we're after, generally speaking, we haven't got a program. So things get increasingly desperate. In, 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 in the, the last resort, sometimes the, the crew goes home, it's just me and a cameraman, we stay on. That happened in the first episode we ever did, the Gunch catfish in, in India. Um, occasionally we might be able to come back, but you know I've got other things to do. Very often it's not an option to come back. Um, I nearly gave up in the uh, when I was after musky. Um, some of you might remember that uh, in Ontario, uh, the last season. That was um, one of those cases where I just felt that that everything was against me. You know, why is it all going against me? And then suddenly this outrageous reversal of fortune. Um, too dangerous. Um, yeah, there was that time in the Congo where the the chief's brother had disappeared, and um, some of the people in the village sort of put two and two together, and, and uh, they were thinking that maybe this was something to do with us. And um, 
you know, there were there were dark plans afoot. We found out, and, and we were we were sort of on standby to just get out of there very quickly. But luckily, that that didn't happen. Um, someone's saying here, do you get any presents from fans? Well, actually, today I'm not wearing it now. I'm just leaning off camera. That is a, that is a, a knitted. This is a jumper, isn't that amazing? And with a with a leaping fish on it, that is um, that is lovely. I'm so I'm so you know it's 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 very touching. Uh, yes, um, occasionally things turn up. Uh, drawings from children, lots of lots of lovely drawings, which is which is is particularly not, well, it's particularly gratifying that so many children are watching, but also the fact that it sort of um, fires their imagination to not just sit back and, and absorb um, entertainment, you know, but also to, you know, sometimes get out and go fishing themselves, sometimes actually to, to, to draw the fish that, they, that they've that they seen and, and, and create sort of scenarios on paper. Great stuff. Um, Alif Mohammed says, good. Aaron Smith says, awesome. Uh, Srithala Purpula says, Did any fish scare you? Yeah, most of the fish that I go after scare me. Um, the whole program is, um, okay, I'm, I'm not trying, I'm not being flippant here, but the whole program is about scary fish. And um, the message that we try and get across is um, if something is scary, how do you respond to it? Do you, if you know, if it's a fish, do you, do you try and kill it or do you stay away from the water? And what we try and show is that there's actually another way you can approach a scary fish or anything else that's scary, and that is you find out about it and you you learn. Um, you know, if you if you know about something, you are able to um, to you know to deal with it safely, safely to coexist with it. So um, yeah, lots of the fish I catch have teeth and spines and poison and electricity and stuff like that but I but uh, as yet I've had a few little scrapes but as yet I'm, I'm still more or less um, unscathed from all that uh, that's just someone saying this is this is uh, Beata Ellis saying they caught several catfish and put them all back loves fishing um, Let's uh, sorry. Best place in the USA you like to fish? That was Samuel Clark. Um, gosh, I've done quite a bit of fishing in the USA now. Um, Trinity River for, for alligator gar. That is an amazing fish that you have in the US that very few people even know about, very few people appreciate, not many people fish for. They're not just in the Trinity River, they're in other places as well. Um, Columbia River, I fished sturgeon up there. Um, Lake Champlain in Vermont and around there, I love that, that was great, there was such a variety of fishing and I was catching them in quite an unusual way, quite a lot of uh, fly fishing there, carp on a fly. Um, most recently I was fishing, some of you might have seen the article, I was fishing Chesapeake Bay for striped bass and I'd caught striped bass before but just little ones and I finally had a great day um, catching um, some really nice um, striped bass with a reporter from USA Today, that was, that was very memorable. Um, let's have a look. Uh, somebody here, this is Megan Gauthier, really likes the conservationist and science undertones of the show. Yeah, we, we try to, um, obviously we try to entertain, we also try and educate, um, but without doing it in a sort of a preachy way. Uh, we often work with scientists as well, we try and sort of learn more about the fish, and although we don't, again, go on a lot um, about conservation. The fact that I put the fish back uh, every program, uh, here's the fish that bit somebody or whatever, well why is it going back in the water? Well it's going back in the water because uh, what was the motive of the fish and, and, and you know generally they are not willfully going for people. It's either they either make a mistake because the visibility in the water is not very good and in that kind of situation someone's foot can look very much like a small fish um, or it's self-defense, uh, if you've trodden on a stingray, um, it's quite entitled, in my opinion, to, to, to stick its spine in you. Um, or um, another thing, you know, fish very often, they, they are defending their nest, they're defending their young. So um, the answer to dangerous fish, just going back to what I was saying a couple of minutes ago, it's, it's our responsibility to, to know about them and then we can keep out of their way, we can coexist with them. Um, 
En verdad tiene un, uh, un programa muy interesante, muchas especies, poco, something, it runs out, that's Carlos Mota. Thank you, it's, I'm, I'm glad. I, of course, we, um, there is a big um, Spanish-speaking um, audience in the US. You do have Discovery in Espanol, and I know lots of people watch it on that, which is great. Um, and I'm trying to improve my, my Spanish. The, the, the person you speak, the person you hear on the Spanish editions is not me. Um, that's someone who speaks a lot better Spanish than I do. But if I started speaking Spanish better, people would be confused because it would be a different voice. So anyway, um, Cody Stanley says, where are you going next and what species are you after? I can't say that, I'm afraid, because there's programs in the pipeline and there is obviously quite a delay between what we film and, and, and when it comes on screen. I'm going to one more of these. It's Kim Keelar. I'm very sorry if I'm mispronouncing some of these names because I'm having to do this all fairly quickly. I've never heard of anyone catching a live giant octopus before. Do you think we will give it a go? And how large would you estimate they could grow to be? Um, giant Pacific octopus grow very big, um, about 20 foot across. Um, I wouldn't try and catch an octopus with fishing gear. It would be um, sort of unethical, un unethical I think. Um, what about... I wouldn't try and grab one either. And I mean, um, but, but, but what I'm doing a lot on this new season, uh, some of you will have noticed already, um, although River Monsters is generally about putting a line in the water, um, it, the line in the water is, is, is a means to an end. It's about how you get to see the fish. And in, in rivers, that tends to be the only way you can get to see a fish. The great thing about the oceans, which is what we're doing this um, season eight, is that you've got water clarity, so I'm getting in the water more, I'm diving more. Okay, uh, that's the end of our time, I'm afraid. Thanks everybody for posting your questions. Uh, tonight, uh, another chance to see the um, Death Down Under episode, followed by the world premiere of the new episode, Raise Ahead. Thanks very much indeed. Sorry to all of you whose questions I've not got to, but uh, thanks again. Keep enjoying the programme. Bye-bye. And a final fish on to everybody.